Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Daily mountain shipping losses in the Pacific were beginning to tell on the Japanese. Unless they could score some far-reaching strategic success, their armies, strung out on a vast perimeter of conquest, faced slow strangulation. It was to Burma that their eyes turned, hopefully. Here was the one place they could stage an offensive that might give them all they hoped. If it succeeded, the destruction of the British forces in Burma was the least of its results. China, completely isolated, would be driven into a separate peace. India, ripe as they thought for a revolt against the British, would fall, a glittering prize into their hands. They were right in thinking that victory in Assam would resound far beyond that remote jungle. I can't keep it up. They were right in thinking. They were right in thinking that victory in Assam would resound far beyond that remote jungle land. He sounded a lot more like that, didn't he? Actually. No, he did. He, but, but quite softly spoken, they were right in thinking that victory in Assam would resound far beyond that remote jungle land. That's it. <laughs> it might indeed, as they proclaimed in their exhortations to their troops, change the whole course of the whole world war. Burma, for a space no longer a sideshow in a global struggle, would hold the centre stage. That was, of course, two sides of Bill Slim. The man he was and the man he became. <laughs> the, man, the man he progressed to. He, <laughs> he cast aside his regional accent <laughs> and went for something altogether a little bit more pucker. Well, Achtung, Achtung, and welcome to part three of Burma 44. This is part three, isn't it? We've managed to... So no, it's part four. Part four. There we go. You see, I've been in the jungle too long, Jim. This is episode four, The Battle Begins. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, reflecting on our last podcast about admin box, um, it reminded me of a thing that Slim, two things that Slim said when he was sort of gathering his thoughts for how they were going to beat the Japanese. And the first was this idea that everyone now is a competent, everyone must patrol, everyone must be, and really a very much I don't care who you are. You know, the hardship of jungle operations demands the highest type of leadership. Training of each individual is an important training objective. But the other thing I was really struck by, and this is really how the admin box battle plans out, is he says all units must get used to having Japanese parties in their rear. And when this happens, regard not themselves but the Japanese are surrounded. It's asymmetric warfare, to use a modern term. It's no longer thinking in terms of lines and, you know, on one side against the other side. Throw all that out of the dishwater and start again and think about this in a completely different way. But also, the admin box, it's Slim's army fighting that battle, but he's not commanding it as such, is he? Not at all. And I think that's a, an interesting sort of distinction between some of the other commanders we talk about. They're very much leaning on their subordinates for what they want them to do. Everyone in this set of circumstances essentially knows what they've got to do. The message has made its way down to everybody. And all those characters we talked about, you know, in isolated positions, sort of on little plugs of land, Japanese offensive swirling around them. They know what they've got to do. They've got to hang on. They've got to not bolt. They've got to sit tight. You protect yourself by protecting others is how the defence at the admin box works. After all, isn't it? Well, yes, and getting your next tier down, you know, and evolving your army in your own kind of way that you want it to reflect it, in a way that 8th Army, once Montgomery takes over, reflects Montgomery and the choice of corps commanders and divisional commanders. It's exactly the same as going on with 14th Army. And what we'll do is a little bit later in this episode, we'll have a look at some of these generals that are going to be fighting the infall battle. Because when I say the battle begins, I don't mean we've done three episodes without any fighting, because obviously we had the admin box. But what I really mean is this is the battle of infall. And admin box is, is the hors d'oeuvre. It's the little taster. It's the kind of testing the new format and the new theories. Is this going to work? And, and resoundingly so, yes, it is. But a much stiffer, bigger test is awaiting them around the Imphal plane. And that's a biggie. Imphal is overshadowed by the word Kahima, the name Kahima, because of what happened there. But this is all part of the Imphal battle. Or more precisely, it's all part of Operation Ugo, which is the, if Hargo was the operation to uh, isolate and destroy British forces, British Indian forces in the Arakan, Ugo is the biggie, which is 
the planned Japanese invasion of Northeast India. And actually, what we should do is we should look at those Japanese plans. And I just want to state right now that we are looking at this whole battle, this whole episode, very much from an allied bias. This is the first punch of a two-fisted attack. And the whole point of it was, obviously, you want to destroy Anglo-Indian forces in the Arakan, but you also want to draw Allied troops away from the main event, this Operation Yugo, which is going to take place kind of a month later. So that's the whole point of that. And it's worth just reminding people that there are only two ways in and out of Burma. There's through the Arakan on the west coast, northwest coast, you know, and into southern Bengal, now Bangladesh, or up on the uh, gap through the hills, through the um, Chin Hills and um, for, across the Chindwin. The Burma border is just to the west of the River Chindwin. And then you've got these hills, and that's your entry into back into India. And that's the, way, the route through which Slim passes through in May 1942 on the retreat from Burma. If you control those hills, you basically control the entrance and the exit to India. Exactly, but there's these two places. So Renya Mutaguchi, who is the commander of the Japanese 15th Army, knows this. You know, the interesting thing about it is that Tokyo and the Burma Army area, which is under General Kawabi, have much more limited ambitions for Yugo. For them, it is about getting a foothold into across those hills, controlling those crossing places in and out of Burma, basically ensuring that Britain can never get back into Burma again. For Mutaguchi, who is the 15th Army commander that will be the strike force behind Operation Yugo, he has much higher ambitions. Mutaguchi's plan is to get into Dimapur, and he just thinks that once you do that, then you can get into kind of you you, you can sort of you know the, the the British Raj in India will fall like a sort of like dominoes, you know, just sort of deck of cards will all just sort of collapse. Jewel in the crown of the British, then comes the jewel in the crown of the Imperial Japanese. You can cut off the hump, which is uh, the mostly American supply line to the Chinese in Chongqing, and you could actually turn the entire war, as Slim was saying in that opening quote. This is striking, though, isn't it? And maybe. It goes- goes some way to explaining why it goes wrong for the Japanese. When you have a general whose intentions are wildly different to his bosses, they've tasked him with one thing and he's planning something else altogether. Things are bound to begin to unravel, aren't they? But the alternative way is saying it's all very Guderian in 1940, you know, because von Kleist is always saying, oh, you know, don't cross there, cross somewhere else and don't get ahead of yourself and all the rest. And he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. And, you know, in 10 days is at the French Atlantic coast. So, you know, I think, I think Mutaguchi is sort of cut from that kind of cloth. I mean, he, you know, he's an absolute bastard. I mean, you know, he's one of your he's a round-headed kind of mustachioed. He was there on the Marco Polo incident. One of the big trigger points in the Japanese-Chinese war anyway. So incredibly aggressive, hates the British with an absolute passion and just feels it's his destiny to lead, you know, and to be fair, his plan is pretty good. Except that he's underestimated his enemy and actually say so he can fault it quite substantially. Well, he, yeah, he, he, yeah well, you can actually. <laughs> you can see how it can work. Yeah. If you're thinking, well, the British will fold like they did two years ago. We apply pressure to them like we did in 1942. They'll make a mess of it and they'll run away because they haven't before. I suppose the, the admin box is maybe the thing which maybe should make him go, mm, maybe we aren't quite ready for this. Well, yes, yes, there is that. But I mean, you know, there's two corps in 14th Army and a third in reserve, which is part of the 11th Army Group, which you'll remember is General George Gifford, who is, you know, so 14th Army is part of the Ceylon defence and collectively the Ceylon forces and 14th Army make 11th Army Group. And the 33rd Corps is the reserve corps for the 11th Army Group that can be redirected. Say the Japanese destroy four corps in, in the Imphal area on the Assam front and suddenly, you know, you're a core down and they're going all the way to the, you know, you've reinforced from Christensen's 15 core and they've been destroyed as well. And suddenly all you've got left is 33 core. You've got a problem on your hands because you can't just suddenly rapidly reinforce British India, you know. So Mutaguchi's plan to get to Dimapur is the upper reaches of what is possible. But had he done so, I don't know, who knows what would have happened. But anyway, we're jumping the gun here. But that's what he's planning. And it's very kind of precisely worked out. So the plan is to assault initially the, the infile plane on a two-front attack and seize the town. And he needs to get to the town because that is absolutely now dominated with airfields, supply dumps. There's six airfields that have been built hastily around Imphal. There are now tarmac roads leading in and out of 
of Imphal, where it was just a sort of one horse dust town. It's now kind of, you know, substantially being reinforced. But it's four parts and two phases. So the first phase, he's got 33 division. So this is Mutaguchi. He's got 33rd division under Lieutenant General Yanagida. And the plan is to cut in on the Tidim Road. And he knows that 17th Indian Division under Punch Cowan is kind of quite a long way down to the south because the whole point is Slim is intending to get back into northern Burma and exactly the same routes that the Japanese are using to get into the Assam area of India. So 17th Division is kind of already quite a long way south from Infal. And the problem is, is you've got that and you've also got 20th Division over on the Shenham Saddle near Tamu and Shenham. And they're not mutually supporting at all. But they can't be because of the shortage of roads and arteries and all the rest of it. So Yanagida is going to go in and cut the Tidim Road and then create a various blocking position. So 140 miles north of Tidim at milestone 100. And that is north of where the bulk of 17th Indian Division is. So as 17th Indian Division realizes that it's basically surrounded, it's been cut off from Imphal, its artery of you know, supply line from Imphal, it will then try and fight back north. They'll find a Japanese blocking position on that road, and they'll do another blocking position further north to prevent reinforcements from Imphal. So that's the idea. And blocking positions are characteristic of how the Japanese fought in 1942, aren't they? That's the thing the British keep running into, isn't it? And part of what goes for, wrong for them in 1942 is, ah, what do we do? We can't use the road as a main artery anymore. Everything would then fall apart from there. And obviously, what's happened since is there's been a bit of a rethink about how you deal with um, roadblocks, essentially. This does show that the Japanese expectations, the British will fight the way they did before. Yeah, and there is the other thing that the Japanese are slightly hoisted by their empire because they haven't been able to develop their war machine in any way, re- meaningful way since 1937, 38. You know, so they, you know, they haven't upgraded their the Navy haven't upgraded the Zeros. The Army hasn't upgraded the Oscars. These are the fighter planes. You know, they haven't got bigger tanks. They haven't got better anti-tank guns. You know, they are an infantry-led army supported by kind of, you know, frankly, minimal amounts of firepower. And their whole modus operandi is to move very, very swiftly, very quickly, beat the enemy in isolation, overrun, take the supplies, feed themselves on the job and keep going. The problem they have is they don't have any way of updating that. You know, the infrastructure they have got is being built on the Navy, which they have to do because they're now in this existential battle against the US in the Pacific. And they just don't have enough and the ability to transport huge amounts of heavy weaponry to somewhere as remote as Northeast Burma. So, on the one hand, it kind of looks incredibly unimaginative because they're just doing the same thing that they've always done. But on the other hand, it was very effective last time, and they haven't really got they haven't really got any choice in the matter. You know, this is interesting, isn't it? Though, because when you're planning like this, the decisions you can make are built around what you're actually capable of, and also your last estimation of what the enemy could do. But really, it's more what they are capable of than what they expect the British to do in this situation, isn't it? That is exactly the point I'm trying to make. And don't forget, one of the key. Parts that we discussed, I think, in episode two was the importance of air power and how the British had cracked that in a way that the Japanese hadn't. And the Japanese have kind of lost the air battle kind of without almost without even realizing it. And the same is true at Imphal, because where are the Japanese airfields? They're freaking miles away. Where are the British airfields? Well, there's six of them around Imphal. Because that's the plane. You can only have an airfield where there's flat ground. So if there isn't any flat ground, you can't have an airfield. So again, it's not just about winning air superiority on the British part of view. It's also about using topography and ground more effectively. And it's also about fighting a battle on the ground of your choosing, which is all very Wellingtonian and Napoleonic and all the rest of it. So Mutaguchi can only do what he can do with what he's got. And basically, this is the best plan, I think. 17th Indian Division are going to go and try and fall back to Pajinval. That is going to happen. And, and then the main thrust of the 33rd Division under Major General Yamamoto is going to be advancing up the Kabul Valley against the 20th Indian Division. So what he's Mutaguchi is then expecting is that the British will then commit their reserves to help out these thrusts. And while their attention is distracted on the Tidim Road and on the Tamu Road towards Burma, to the southeast of Imphal, he'll then do the second part of his 
his operation, the second phase of his operation, which is to throw his two most powerful attacks much further to the north. So this is in two main thrusts. The first one will be sending two regiments of 15th Division under Lieutenant General um, Yamauchi, will head to the north of Imphal and then turn southwest. So effectively, you're then attacking from both areas. You're attacking from the south, from the southeast, and from the north. Whilst at the same time, he'll then send an entire division, 31st Division under Lieutenant General Sato, 20,000 men will be striking towards Kohima. And the idea is that by this point, the British have committed their reserves to deal with the, with the initial phase and therefore be off balance and unable to repulse this second, much heavier offensive. Exactly. And Kohima is key because it's on hills. It's a tiny little Naga village where Naga tribesmen are kind of headhunters. Kohima is, is literally sort of two goats and kind of, you know, four corrugated iron houses at this point. But it's on a saddle surrounded by much higher hills. And the key thing is, is the single road, the one only road that goes from Dimapur to Imphal, 135 miles away, Kahima is there. So Kahima is this really key position because if you hold Kahima, you've got a fantastic blocking position for anyone trying to re- to any British forces trying to re- reinforce from Dimapur. And you've also severed the supply line south to Imphal, cutting off any future reinforcements. So that's the plan. And frankly, you know, if I was slim, I'd be pretty terrified by that. It's worth just before we, we um, finish this, this part and take a break, just describing the landscape around here. You know, Imphal is hot and dusty. It really is a very, very obvious plain. But even from there, you can see the hills rising up. When you go south down the Tidim Road, it's got eucalyptus trees and dusty little settlements and villages and huge great... It's, it's either side of the road are paddy fields, you know, cattle and animals and goats and chickens all over the place and that kind of stuff. I mean, today it's a kind of busy thoroughfare with scooters and trucks and stuff all hurtling past at great speed. But very quickly north of Imphal, the hills start to rise. So that's the landscape. But Imphal itself is kind of hot and dusty and kind of, yeah, it's a pretty unforgiving part of the world. But anyway, we should take a break there. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. We've uh, looked at Mutaguchi Renya's plan for shutting the British down in India altogether. Well, he's turning the whole tide of the war, actually, you know, because, <laughs> you know, cut off the hump and suddenly, you know, reverses in China. Yeah, and, you can't you know, afford the guy's ambition. He's, no, you can't afford him on ambition. It's suddenly, you know, he's, he's the daddy man <laughs> and the great hero of the emperor. Anyway, so... Um, Slim reflects. For us too, it was our great chance with landing craft and shipping unavailable. As we've seen, there never is shipping for Burma. We should have had to re-enter Burma overland from the north. We were in fact planning to do so. Yet the topography of the country was so terribly against us and so limited with the forces we could maintain through the mountains that any such invasion must be a gamble unless we could first wear down the Japanese strength. I wanted a battle before we went into Burma, and I was as eager as Kawabe to make it a decisive one. Both recognise that this is this is a kind of do or die for 14th Army as it is for the Japanese 15th Army. You know, great glory or failure, and it could go either way. That's uh, that's the interesting thing about it. And that, so the stakes set up beforehand. It's it's very unusual, I think, that you get yourselves into a situation where you're where in a battle, and it's so kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Also that. Slim's going, I don't know, this is, we're going to have a battle before we get to Burma, which, which suggests a battle that's much more on his terms. But I also think it's one where generalship really, really comes into it, whereas quite often Alamein, for example, you know, it's only going to ever end one way, you know, and that's obviously partly to do with generalship, you know, Monty's generalship that he trains all his men a certain way and that he holds fast and, you know, builds up all his supplies and makes sure that he can't possibly lose. It's not quite the same here. It is really about cat and mouse and outfoxing different sides. And Well, both sides are trying to pull the wool over the other and both sides are trying to do something decisive. You know, there's not an attempt to maintain a status quo by either side. You know, the, the Japanese could retreat to the Sitang and hold that. No one would ever get across it if they wanted to. They're not settling for that. And Slim isn't going to settle for that, the equivalent either, because he could plug the gaps to hold the two entry points into Burma with the forces at his disposal, and the Japanese would would never get into India, would never have this option. So it's interesting, isn't it? It's more than Rommel getting to Alexandria, this. Yeah, absolutely. And his plan, and this is an interesting one, because it goes against the grain of, of what most British army commanders are taught and encouraged to do, and indeed, I would argue, Germans as well, is that he is 
absolutely intentionally going to withdraw. The whole point is that they're going to withdraw back towards Imphal. But it's going to be a fighting withdrawal. So the whole plan is to grind down the Japanese as they pull back. What will then happen is that the Japanese will be overextended. They'll be exhausted. They'll have used lots of their ammunition, lots of their supplies. And 14th Army, or four core, as it is um, in this part, will be able to then reinforce because they're closer to Infar where their supply dumps are. And then they'll be able to counterattack and completely crush the Japanese. That's the plan. And this can be now done in a way that it couldn't have been done before because there's a different mindset, there's a different attitude, there's this understanding that you can trade space for time and you shouldn't get hung up about straight lines and all this kind of stuff and traditional forms of fighting a war. And also because the men are now trained for this. This is what they've been trained to do. It's about letting the Japanese think they have the initiative and then depriving them of it but also because they're essentially unimaginative in the way they're going to prosecute their operations, making the same mistake over and over again. Yeah. We talk so much about Slim. We've talked a lot about Mesavi and touched on Briggs, who's the 5th Indian Division, and Mesavi, obviously, 7th Indian Division over in the Arakan. But so many of these commanders, Punch Cowan, Uvi Roberts, Jeffrey Schoons, you know, these are people, and Gracie, th- these are names that are just not in the vernacular. They're not known and they're, they're forgotten men, but they're all really interesting. And I think it's w- one of the key things about the spring of 1944 and 14th Army is this is a new breed of men. You know, this is a bit like that transitional period from, you know, everything before the fall of Tobruk was kind of, you know, the duffers. By the time Monty and Alex turn up in summer of 1942, then, you know, you've got the better breed of commander. The same sort of thing is happening here with 14th Army. So 4th Corps is commanded by... Jeffrey Schoons, who's a kind of sort of thin angular guy. He looks a little bit like Percy Hobart, actually. Staff officer at the Director of Military Operations and Intelligence in India, then Deputy Director by 1940, and Director of the Director of of Military Operations and Intelligence by 1941. And then he's promoted to command 19th Division um, in 1942, and then 4th Corps in Slim's new 14th Army, although actually he's appointed in July 1943. He is considered very kind of, very learned, very you know, absolutely spot on on his staff work, all that kind of stuff, absolutely buys into kind of everyone being trained, gets all that kind of stuff, a forward thinker, so embraces modernity and all that kind of stuff. But there's no getting away from the fact that this is his first command experience of, of you know, combat command experience since 1918. Yeah, so David Punch Cowan. He's called Punch. His nickname Punch because he has a he sort of like um, Mr. Punch. He, he looks a bit like Mr. Punch with his big sort of hawk <laughs> nose and whatever. He's a kind of mess of e character. He's nimble on his feet, fighting commander, all that kind of stuff. And he's very interesting. He's actually born in Malaga in Spain in 1898. He tends to Glasgow University, joins the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders in 1915, but then posted the Indian Army in 1917 and wins a MC, a military cross with the Gurkha Rifles. Again, post-war, he's on the Northwest Frontier. Brigadier early in the war, and then sent to Quetta as director of military training. Interesting thing about him is he is a divisional commander of 17th Indian Division from 1942 to 1945. Do you know the only other person who commands a division as long as him? Uh, Francis Tuker? No, it's Freiburg. <laughs> really? Oh. Occasionally dipping up to up to Kamala up to Kukor, Kukor, but he, he commands the second Indian, the New Zealand division. How interesting. The thing is, is Cowan is, if you have read about this, Cowan's a name that, that does recur, but mainly because he's been in so long. I mean, it's interesting he retains his job after 1942, because that is the great clear out, isn't it, after the collapse in 42. So clearly... Well, he's a Quetta, so he, he, you know, he misses out on all of this stuff. I mean, all these guys have missed out on the defeats. And it's interesting, both Schoons and Cowan are, are Gurkha. You know, that's their background, Indian Army, all that stuff. So. Roberts is just fantastic. 1898, he's born Cheltenham College, Royal Military Academy, Woolwich, King's Cambridge. He's a Royal Engineer. He's not a Gurkha. He then goes back to England and then serves intelligence in India before taking over as GSO-1. So this is General Staff Officer Number 1 for the 10th Indian Division in January 1941, which is then, of course, commanded by Slim. So he sees Slim, and Slim absolutely loves the cut of his jib. And he is then posted to Iraq, you know, and... Roberts is put in charge of defending RAF um, Habanaya, which is this great action where they kind of, you know, they have to defend this air ground and against the kind of, you know, Iraqi insurrectionists and all the rest of it. And he wins the DSO and gets huge kind of credit for that. Then involved in the kind of the fighting in, in Syria in the summer of 1941, given a brigade, and then takes 23rd Indian Infantry Division in the summer of 1943. He's very tight with Schoons, very tight with Slim, 
very good people person. Everyone loves him. And then the third one is uh, the third division in four corps is the 20th Indian Infantry Division. So you have the 17th, 23rd, and 20th. And this is commanded by Douglas Gracie, who's yet again another Gurkha officer. Blundell's Public School in Devon, Sandhurst, France, wounded in 1915, um, recovers, posted to Indian Army, wins MC and Bar. Staff College at Quetta rather than back in England. At the start of the war, he's a battalion commander of the Northwest Frontier, then under Christensen, you know, who we met before in the Arakan, before becoming brigadier at 17th Infantry Brigade and posted to Iraq. So again, you know, he's out of the picture in Malaya and Burma. I mean, this does contrast, I mean, it, well, not only it contrasts with the state of things under Noel Irwin, for instance, when we were at Shrivenham not so long ago, we talked about, you know, when people talk about allies at war, and the Allied generals all falling out with each other and were sort of and sniff around looking for tension. And then you compare it to the German side, where basically officers are being told to commit suicide if they fail. You know, the, the difference in cultures is completely different. I think it's comparable here, isn't it? The Japanese generals and all that, it's all this bit. I mean, obviously. It's, it's Gloria Sapeco, isn't it? You know. Yeah. The Japanese officers might be good people, people, and might be good, meticulous at detail, like some of the descriptions we've had of these guys. But hanging over them is this extreme motivational environment for, for how they yeah, should deliver Yeah, it's interesting because of that lot, of that lot in four core. I mean, I would say there's a slight question mark over Schoons' ability, you know, He's competent. Is he imaginative? Probably not. But Roberts, Uver, Uvery Roberts, Gracie and Punch Cowan, you know, they're really top-notch. You know, they are really, really good. They absolutely have embraced all that Slim and, you know, people like Messavi and Christensen have all been saying about, you know, this different way of thinking, you know, training absolutely everybody. They're just totally on board on all this. They absolutely get it. I've got to say that the Infar battle is incredibly complicated because there's so many different things going on. Or, you know, we call it the Battle of Infar, but actually you've got all these different thrusts. You've got the one from the Tidin Road, the one from over the Shenham Saddle from the southeast. You've got, you know, these thrusts heading north of Imphal and then towards Kahima. So there's an awful lot going on, and it's just impossible to tell entirely chronologically. One thing I think, think I, I would say maybe is is that Four Core is a little bit under strength here, you know, considering what they're trying to do. You know, could they have brought more troops in? The problem is, is you've only got this one road going from Dimapur. You know, to get to Imphal, you can either fly in, but there's limitations on that, or... You've got to go the traditional way, which is train up to Dimapur, cross the Brahmaputra River, get on that one road all the way down. And, you know, supplying this area, which, we, you know, is something that we've sort of gone on and on about since the first episode, is really, really difficult. And the fact of the matter is, there's also the strain of the Ord Wingate's second Chindit operation, which is taking place about the same time, which is requiring a huge amount of supply. Punch Cowan in command of 17th Division, he figures out what's going on. He knows that the Japanese... Well, the are- Japanese attack much earlier. So, so, so Slim and his people have 14th Army and indeed Schoons at Forecourt. They have intel that the Japanese are mounting this attack. They're expecting it to come. You know, this is why... Slim is able to prepare this battle plan of this idea of going back into fighting retreat towards Imphal, a trip the Japanese, then counterattack, wear them all out, then we can think about going in back into Burma. So, you know, he knows this is going to happen, but he thinks it's going to happen on the 15th of March. That's the date that they've got. So both Slim and Schoons are completely wrong-footed when the first Japanese attack comes in the first week of March on 17th Indian Division to the south. That's a big problem. But the good thing is, is that Punch Cowan decides to ignore Schoons' orders, very much in a Guderian von Kleist way of May 1940, and just starts to fall back immediately before the Japanese are properly able to cut the roads in the way that they need to. So you suddenly have this incredibly ferocious fighting going on. The situation on the Tidim Road was now for a time as it had been on the Arakan coast, a Neapolitan ice of layers of our troops alternating with the Japanese. But both in training and morale, our men were much better fitted to deal with such a confused and harassing business than they had been in 1943. And again, they are hugely supported by the RAF, who are bombing and strafing the Japanese positions. And, and you know, the Japanese don't have any answer to this. They don't have many anti-aircraft guns. You know, the whole point is they're travelling light. This starts on the 6th of March, right? This fighting back, or the fighting retreat that Cowan operates, they get to Imphal on the 4th of April, right? Now that's more than 20 days. 
Because at the end of the admin box battle, I think one of the things you pointed out is that the Japanese are starving. That's why they withdraw. That's what takes the wind out of their sails in the end is that their men are starving. They can't carry on. And so we're already well past that 20-day ration scale. Yeah, but... You know, Punch Cowan hasn't been given enough credit for this. I mean, you know, Rob Lyman in his brilliant book on Slim absolutely gives him the, you know, resurrects Cowan's performance here and, and is quite critical of Schoons for kind of being slow off the mark. You know, and Slim is a bit slow off the mark, to be perfectly honest. And suddenly they realise, you know, on the 14th of March that this is crisis moment. You know, this is all kicking off. But on this bit, at any rate, on the Tidin Road, Slim's strategy is working. But then there's the Shenham saddle. And again, it's just lots and lots of battles and different engagements along these hills and and sort of, you know, but but, but basically they're able to hold the Japanese off and then eventually start to pull back. So they they, rather than run a fighting retreat, they actually try and block and hold them and and destroy them. Well, they block and hold them and then eventually they pull back to Imphala as well. But by that point, they've already kind of... You know, you've you've just got these hills there, which are just which just say defend me. And there's a place called Recky Hill, and if you stand on there, it's the same view. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. One of the most best preserved battlefields I've ever been to. However, General Sato's entire thirty first division bypass this battle and get around to the north. It's all very well these two successful encounters with the Japanese, but there's more coming. Cowan's operations on the Tidin Road have been successful. Gracie's operations on the Shenham Saddle have been successful. But that has, you know, Schoons has sent his his reinforcements to support those operations. And so the back door is open. And this is the plan. This is Mutaguchi's plan. The British commit their reserves to deal with these initial two actions. And the idea is that they then have nothing left in the tank to deal with this thrust. Yes. And he's not far wrong because catastrophe is absolutely looming. Slim and Schoons have not seen this coming, which, frankly, when you consider the kind of, you know, the ability of of Japanese to go through jungle at very great speed, is frankly extraordinary. Right. Well, so join us in our next episode to find out how Slim and Schoons and et al. react to this looming catastrophe. I mean, if Um, that's not cliffhammer, I don't know what uh, is. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you want to listen to all these in one go, you can join our Patreon. Join the Patreon, become a member um, on the Patreon. Not that long ago, all of the recorded talks from We Have Ways Fest have been put out, so you can work your way through those. And I, I've got some of that to listen to myself because I couldn't be in two places at once. Or join our Apple podcast channel, uh, Officer Class, and become um, become a member and subscribe to that. And your opportunity there is to – everything's curated in subject order because there's bits of these battles we've touched on before, actually, that will be out there for you to listen to. Here's an interesting thing. While we were talking, Jim, a, a friend of mine sent me this. Her grandfather was in Burma. She said, morning, listen to the first Burma pod last night. Maybe smile for so many reasons. Seven years ago, after reading Burma 44, I used the concept of morale from the Burmese campaign, spiritual intellectual material, in an interview for a medical teaching job. I felt it paralleled beautifully with the challenges of the NHS, and they loved it. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? And she said, I went Googling, this is my friend Catherine, I went go- also went Googling for my granddad's name and found this. Apparently, he never sent for his medal, just has the ribbon, but I haven't seen his writing before. So there's him writing in. Um, it's him with his address asking for his medal from the Burma Star Association in Leeds. So there we go. How amazing. The lessons resonate even to today. The even campaign. to this day. That's even why history day. is um, worth being interested in. And that's why it's relevant. But you all know that. That's why you're listening to this podcast. Yeah, we should also put up some maps. I think maps are incredibly useful. Yeah, we'll put some maps up. Um, thanks for listening. We'll see you again in the next one. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Cheerio.